Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello and welcome to Just Branding. Today we have Hussein Al Mosawi with us, who's an award-winning product designer, creative director, visual effects artist, and consultant to world-famous companies like Nike, Apple, Google, and more. When not consulting or creating mind-blowing designs, Hussein helps creators harness their fire, flex their courage, and supercharge their ideas to create remarkable products, services, and experiences. He's literally just released a book uh, titled The Innovator's Handbook, a short guide to unleashing your creative mindset, which is full of insights, ideas, stories, and practical exercises that will take your creative thinking to the next level. The book is quite the work of art itself. It has all the bells and whistles you can expect from a visual effects artist. So print uh, geeks, listen up. There's soft touch lamination, holographic foiling, spot UV, and three neon spot colors all printed on a 120 GSM wood-free paper. So it sounds like quite the treat. I'm looking forward to my copy coming very soon. Uh, well done, Jacob Zane. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Welcome, he said. But look how he's counted all the spot colors and stuff. This guy, like J Jacob, loves <laughs> all, that, all that design stuff. I'm getting older and less into that stuff. But yeah, awesome. Welcome to the show. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Song. Thank you. And I'm glad you appreciate that stuff because, uh, you know, like the design of a book itself is just like an object. And as a product designer, an industrial designer, like looking at those details, amount of colors, the type of paper, the cover. So it's uh, it's been an interesting uh, process, just creating and designing the book, not just writing it. Yeah, I can only imagine. It's um, yeah, it's pretty rare these days to get such a you know exquisite piece of art in you know a book form. So I have a quick question about this book before we get into the podcast proper. It, sure. Jacob, you said wood-free paper. So what, what what is it made of then? If there's no wood in it, that's a good question that I don't have the answer for. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. there we are. Maybe someone will write in and tell us what wood-free paper is made of. Please do educate us because, yeah, I mean, awesome. But um, yeah, maybe it's some sort of gum or something. I don't know. Or who knows? Plant. But the texture is really nice. Uh, wood-free paper. I know that the texture is much nicer when you feel it when you're like turning the pages. But exactly what it's made of, I I honestly don't know. It's an innovation on paper. There you go. <laughs> Boom. Let's, that, that is how we start these kind of podcasts. Okay, let's get into it. Sorry, I'll stop asking irrelevant questions. Uh, well, I, I, let's let's nice. start with like how you actually got into you know writing a book on innovation. Like where did that where that spark come from? Sure. So so as you mentioned in your intro, I've uh, I've had the pleasure of working with different uh, innovative companies, some of the most innovative companies in the world, like Nike, Adidas, uh, Pepsi, Apple, uh, Intel. So. Just being on the inside of these companies and seeing and observing how they work, working with some of the most brilliant minds in the industry, I picked up some patterns from one company to the other, like overlapping patterns. And there was never this kind of guideline in each company, like this is how you innovate. But it was just a mindset that I found among these amazing people. And yeah, so going from one company to the other, uh, when I came out, I, I was really always curious about what actually makes these companies as innovative as they are. So when I was giving like keynote uh, talks, doing workshops, teaching, I've taught in different universities. Uh, I've tried to integrate some of these lessons and insights into my teachings. And eventually that led to compiling them together and organizing these small insights that give you a shift in your mindset and help you become more innovative. So eventually that led to, to writing the book. Amazing. Yeah, I can only imagine like going into these huge companies and seeing how, how they actually work. So... I'm really looking forward to reading reading this. So I'm curious, though, what, what exactly is innovation to you? How do you see it? So in, innovation it has lots of different meanings. Uh, even if you just research online, everybody kind of has a different definition and, a, and explains it in a different way. But basically thinking outside the box, how can you improve an existing product that is there and ex is an existing experience? How can you elevate it? How can you solve problems? So that is innovation, taking a problem and designing uh, something to fix that problem and throughout the design process, improving it and making it something better and well needed. So so that's in how I see innovation. And it could be a uh, visual, it could be an actual product, like if we're talking as graphic designers, brand designers, visually, how can you innovate? How can a logo be a smart logo where it's like, it's... Uh, people can get the message behind the, the small icon on a piece of paper or on a billboard. So 
So it can be both visual and also it can be something that is functional. And eventually the idea is to marry the two, the two together. So something that is beautiful and has utility. And, you know, you call them, we call them utility in the industry. Utility. That's lovely. Oh, I love that. That's good. <laughs> I got a quick question. So, um, so you talk about incremental innovation, which is where you take something that is in existence. Um, obviously there's all, I, I should, we should probably throw into the mix, right? Like completely new things, right? That solve problems in completely different ways. Sure. Um, I know it's much harder to do that, but I guess that, that would also count and, and should probably be taken into the mix of our conversation. For no, that's a really good question. And like, as a kid growing up, wanting to be a designer and looking at these innovators and being inspired by them, it always felt super overwhelming to be an innovator and to innovate. Like you'd see these big ideas and these big companies but in fact, it's uh, it's all these big companies with smaller teams on the inside. There's always like four or five people that make up a team. And that's where the innovation happens. And to your point, uh, I also mentioned this in the book. Uh, there's two kinds of innovations, uh, just to make it less overwhelming. One is to, to act and the other is to react. One is to have the followers mindset. One is to have the leaders mindset. And to have the followers mindset, looking at innovations that exist, looking that things are out there, uh, trying to add a twist to it, having a remix uh, of things that are already out there, and just you know incremental and small uh, improvements that would innovate. The other kind is uh, to be an act to act and have a leader's mindset and to come up with groundbreaking ideas, kind of reinvent the wheel where it takes you more towards the inventor's territory versus an innovator's territory. So there's always the two, but for me growing up, I always thought of innovation being somebody who always reinvents the wheel, but that is absolutely not true. So it's good to mix, sometimes uh, innovate baby steps incrementally, and sometimes just think totally outside of the box and do something that's never been done before. So it's good just to know that at least. Yeah. Um, just sort of a quick question, just so that we kind of frame things for our audience and, and, and for our conversation. So, you know, you've gone into companies like Nike and Apple and Google and, and some amazing companies. What sort of products were you innovating? Can you give us just some like what was it a new trainer for Nike or a new sneaker? I, I guess you'd call it um, Apple. What, what kind of stuff was it that you were actually working on that you can share? Sure. So I've worked in different industries. I've worked in the automotive. I won't get into the specifics of the companies just for legalities, but I've worked sure. in the automotive industry. I've worked in the tech industry and I've worked in the footwear industry. And I'd say the biggest uh, role that I've played or worked in is, has been the footwear industry. So working with Nike, working with Adidas, uh, currently through my studio, working with other brands, uh, including Nike and Adidas. So designing uh like for example when i was at adidas i was a senior concept designer and i was looking at ideas that would come out four or five years out in the future and just concepting around them what if the future of this sport looked this way or this way or this way so asking what if questions and thinking blue sky uh no idea is stupid no question is stupid just putting crazy ideas together and starting to ask the right questions that's really what i did all the time uh just think outside the box. Of course, me and the team and collaboration is a huge part of innovation, working with the right people uh, that help push the idea left and right and go from point A to B to C. So having that kind of flexibility uh, that always pushed and uh, brought the innovative ideas to life. So you said ask the right questions. Do you have any particular go-to questions that you use? So one method that we... Uh, that we did a lot in footwear and I used a lot and I still use it to this day when I'm doing product design. Uh, it's called the first principles method. And uh, this is a, it's a method that Elon Musk has talked about also with Tesla and his uh, SpaceX and all the stuff that he does. And it's a really interesting method. So basically let's say I'm designing a shoe that needs to be comfortable, uh, lightweight and durable, just for example. So what I would do is I would take that shoe, break it down into its most simple parts, the laces, the cushioning, the the upper the sole as much as i can i break it down put it on a table and start to ask questions about each part is this part necessary do i really need this can i improve this part is there like new technology where i could exchange this material with another one do we really need lacing so it really helps you break down the product into its simplest parts and then also ask questions specifically to each each of those parts and then when we did that we kind of came up with the right questions and uh, got answers that led us in towards a better and a more innovative product. That's amazing. I, it's, it's really interesting to hear you talk like that because 
Um, I use sort of similar techniques when looking at, um, you know, brands and, and improving customer experience, right? So mm -hmm. you take the customer experience, you break it down into its core components, and then you look at it, um, look to make improvements. As you say, is this relevant? How can we make this better? How can we solve problems? Where's the pain? So I, I just think that's awesome. It's kind of like, it's like being a, you know, it's, it's design, isn't it? And it's uh, it's universal in, in, in how we can attack things. But it's so hard to do in a, in a, an exciting, you know, in in, in absolutely ways. So, yes. yeah. And to your point, uh, I worked in the as a UX designer for some time, uh, like with EA okay. Sports and FIFA, and I also worked in the automotive industry on all the stuff that you see on the screens, like digital experience and all that. So, to your point, just from a UX perspective, also breaking down that consumer journey and seeing how they would turn on the car, how they would interact with the screen, the menus, and everything. And even breaking it down in a UX perspective, it's the exact same same way. Uh, is this necessary? Is it not necessary? Uh, can we skip this step? And just observing things at a detail level. That's that's the core of it. Brilliant. Thank you for sharing that. So was, are there any other, I guess, methods that you use? So I, I, was, I was browsing your site and one of them was like the what if question where it's like, what if Elon Musk was going to design this? Or what if someone else was going to bring out this product? I thought that was a really, um, you know, simple way to actually, you know, think differently. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's actually even one of the exercises that I give in my workshops. Like, what if the Pope was to design the the next, uh, let's say, car of 2020 or no, 2026, 2020, 2030? What would that look like? So you look at things in a much different perspective. What if Superman... Uh, was to do a store that sold this and that. So it really changes your mindset and it shifts it. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, like other things that I would do uh, or that I did observe, uh, for example, let's say, again, let's go back to shoes just because I've worked on a lot of shoes. I want to do a shoe that is lightweight and it's uh, durable. So when I started out designing, I would take that shoe and I would just come up with different ideas and sketch and think about the best shoe possible. Uh, being laser focused is really key. So what does the lightest shoe on earth look like? I'm just going to look at lightweight. I'm not going to look at anything else. And then when I just design for lightweight, just design for durability, just design for comfort, then I have uh, a mix of different ingredients in these different buckets that I can eventually start to mix and match. So it's much easier to do that rather than Okay, it's lightweight and it's durable and it's comfortable and it's this and that. It just confuses you. So just breaking things down again uh, and targeting and being laser focused on each, it's super important. So that's one thing. Uh, the what if is another thing. I do lots of uh, concept projects. For example, what does a Tesla football boot look like? What does a Mercedes Benz uh, uh, running shoe look like? So trying to mix these uh, irrelevant uh, things together and bringing them together that also always gives birth to uh, different kind of innovative ideas. Okay. So if you were to tell our listeners how to be innovative, right? I know you've written a whole book on this, but how would you actually describe that or tell someone or teach someone to be more innovative? So I think it's all about your mindset, really. Uh, just how you think and how you look at things. And even some of the things I mentioned in the book, it could feel obvious or it could feel like it's it's not too complex or it's not too difficult. But sometimes it's really the simple stuff that we just overlook when we're designing and throughout our process. So, I mean, there's a few things like be laser focused on the different elements you're designing for. Be curious. Always ask what of questions. Be a curious sponge. Uh, soak everything in. As kids, we always ask very interesting and curious questions. And as we grow up, we start to, to lose that questioning of things. And society teaches us not to question things. I mean, if you look at Leonardo da Vinci, he's always asking crazy questions in his notebook. What does a woodpecker's tongue look like? Why is the sky blue? Why this? Why that? So it really makes you think and it pushes you to think outside the box. So that's another thing. Collaboration is a huge thing. Uh, diverse teams, when you're building a team and putting a team together, the more different we are, the more different perspectives we're going to have on the table and the more interesting the ideas are going to be. Because the way I look at something, the way you look at something and the way somebody else looks at something is just going to be very different. So if all those come together, it could be very interesting. And then, yep, just one more. Uh, <laughs> and then the Medici families, for example, in the Renaissance, uh, how did innovation happen there? They brought the, the poet and the sculptor and the artist and the musician and all the banker. They brought them all together 
And that's what gave uh, birth to the Renaissance. All these diverse people came together and it was a melting pot. That's where I was going to go with that the, before you, um, you know, finished up was the, the teams aspect, right? Organizations are often built with teams. So I think it would be a good avenue to explore a little bit deeper in how we actually bring innovation to the table with, with teams, right? So sure. what's your um, experience in, in, you know, bringing innovation to, to teams and making so it work th there's well? There's a book I would recommend uh, that it actually got me started thinking a lot about innovation maybe 12 years ago. It's called The Medici Effect by Franz Johansson. Uh, and the whole idea of that is how can we bring in diversity into our workflow and in, into our process? So when we're talking about diverse teams, uh, looking at culture, looking at religion, looking at language, looking at geographical location, uh, someone's single, someone's married, someone has kids. So the more different we are uh, and the more diverse we are, it's just natural that new ideas and different ideas are going to emerge on the table. So if I was to put a team together, uh, and I, I work with a lot of teams now in different companies through my consultancy, uh, I always, when I'm putting my team together, I always try to bring people that are different and also different skill sets. Because uh, if we're all doing the same set, uh, the, the same thing, if we're all doing branding, if we're all doing 3D, if we're all doing product, it's going to be good. We're going to push each other, but not as much as uh, having different skill sets that can influence each other directly and indirectly. Would you have any practical examples of that? Maybe, you know, some of an experience of how you've, you've actually done that in a, you know, a real world scenario. Sure. So, so, I mean, in the industry, I've seen it a lot and I've been a part of different diverse teams, for example, in footwear, uh, different specialties would work together, whether it's the color designer, graphic designer, footwear designer, 3d concept. We all sit together. We ideate together. We brainstorm together. So that's like from a skills aspect from a per, like on a personal level like there's people from different countries speaking different languages uh coming from different backgrounds different cultures uh it's very diverse and of course uh, skills is going to be the first thing you're going to look for when you're hiring someone i'm not saying to overlook the skills part but uh on top of the skills the more you can bring in diversity into your teams the stronger it's going to be on a personal level, when I'm hiring people, I'm also looking for, for those kind of things. So, for example, I'd work with a storyboard artist. I'd work with a compositor. I'd work with a uh, a sound guy who brings in, like, puts, does the music for the visual effects and all that stuff. We're all, like, from different parts around the world. And it's really interesting. Even when we ha just have random conversations, uh, it's always interesting because everybody has something new and a different story to tell. And those stories start to inspire us. And those inspirations start to lead to designing and creating great things. Sounds like you had a lot of experience with working with teams. So it's, um, you know, a very good skill to have. And I think even Matt uh, has this skill set as well with like being the, the kind of like the X-Man in the middle, um, you know, bringing all these people together and helping them work together as, w as well. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I and, and one point to, to that, I mean, just talking about teams, I've also worked on teams that are very positive and teams that are negative. Uh, so keep all the diversity thing aside. If you have a negative team, I don't care where you come from. That's going to kill ideas. That's not going to work. Mm. I've worked with I amazing agree. teams. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was, I, I was going to say because negative teams, right? Here's the thing I find with negativity. I mean, I, we could, we could spend hours on this, right? But <clears throat> negativity often bring, it stems from some fear somewhere right in in an individual and that becomes like then a herd mentality right and it and, and this is my view anyway you, i'm not a psychologist so you could say matt you're crazy but uh, that's that's my instincts is it stems down from fear so when you find somebody who's overly negative they're fearful of something and the problem with fear is that it, it, it's not a good place for creativity to live, right? Because creativity is thinking of new stuff, and in 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 what you know, in in context of what we're talking here about innovation, we need to be brave, right? We need to find the reasons why this will work, because for sure we could probably think of a hundred reasons why it won't. So let's figure out, you know, let's be brave, let's be positive, and let's let's think of positive ways uh, forward. And I think that's why negative teams are are a problem. Having said that. You kind of do need realists, right, on teams, I find. I don't know what you, your thoughts sure, are about, sure. about yes. this. Um, have you heard of Edward de Bono's Six Hints? I was just thinking that, parallel yeah, thinking. Yeah, that's a really cool technique. Have you heard of that, are you saying? No, I haven't. 
So um, Edward de Bono, he was, um, I think he was a Portuguese, I, I might have got that wrong, um, psychologist, I think he, he's no longer with us now. And he wrote a book called The Six Thinking Hats. And he he kind of, I think he was the one that coined the phrase parallel thinking, right? Mm. And what, what he did is these six hats represented six modes of thinking. And and he had a he had one called the black hat, which was negative thinking, but that was only one hat, right? The other, the the other five hats were were had, had different modes of thought, which were all po- pretty much positive. I think one was neutral uh, around data and facts, but the others were like around growth. Uh, I can't remember them off the top of my head right now. I should probably look this up, right? But the interesting thing about that is. Um, is that what what he's sort of uh, the, the 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 proposition there is that look we are all diverse we all have a natural inclin- inclination to look at a new idea in in a specific way but if we can all think about that idea from the same perspective then we can be more pro- pro- productive so in other words if we need to be a realist if we need to kind of think what could go wrong with this, then let's all think of that together. But let's not that make that the mantra of our team and let that dominate the way that we think. For sure. Let's 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 kind of and, and I think the dominating, in my view, is the dominating factor for success in any kind of uh team is 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 positivity. Like we can do this, we will do this, we will get there. We have we will face challenges, but we will overcome. Um that's what that's my gut. Anyway, what are your thoughts on no, that? No, I, I like that. I like that absolutely. And I agree 100 percent And and when you mentioned fear, I mean I've worked on teams that uh I mean you see the insecurity in some people again it leads to negativity. I think that is fear. You see yep. the the jealousy would come in and some teams I think it goes back to fear of uh, them not proving themselves and others people proving themselves. So I think fear is definitely the right word to choose there. And and yeah, I've been part of teams that are super negative. I've seen, you know, the politics, the egos, the jealousy all kick in. And ideas, not, I've seen amazing ideas on those teams that have all died and made it nowhere. On the other hand, I've worked with teams where, you know, I mean, to your point, uh, you need people who are realistic. I'm not saying just hype and hype. But even if I don't like your idea, I can be like, yeah, and we can do this and that. So it's called the power of and, uh, building on your idea. So would I say and or I would, would I say but? That's a huge thing. Like, yeah, your idea is but let's do this. But if I say and let's do this, let's do this and divert it in that way. So I think being really strategic also about how you talk and how you uh, share ideas with your team, I think that's really plays a huge role absolutely 100 percent. so once you have that as a base and then let's talk about diversity <laughs> yeah awesome and it's interesting how you talked about diversity because you know in the corporate world there's a lot of noise about diversity and inclusion and we're talking about um minority groups and stuff like that i i definitely think that that we we can lose our way a little bit looking at things from a group her uh, you know that that group sure, we've sure, got sure. to have representatives from all these groups I, th- I think the way that you've explained it is quite interesting in the in in relation to different stages of life, different backgrounds, different culture. Um, it's having that kind of diversity uh, and the focus on the blend, which sounds quite right. interesting. Uh, and, and the to- diversity and inclusion, honestly, like uh, I'm not going to mention any company names, but most of it is a PR stunt, unfortunately. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, if you just go to the job applications and you see the different kind of... Uh, Eth- what's it called the like if you're white you're black you're uh, african you know there's different kind of things you don't see everybody there so <laughs> i usually just put other <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this is all the companies that brag about diversity and uh, inclusion so it's a lot of it is a pr stunt uh i don't really buy into that stuff but uh but yeah i mean small teams those are the teams that you'd look after like if i'm leading a team four or five people i just take care of that team and then that team leads to innovation regardless of what the whole company is doing. So I've got a question about this small team thing. Why do you think it has to be a small team? I guess is is the first question. And the second question is, is do you often find that this team um, is completely detached from the day-to-day of an organization? Or do people kind of, do you bring people in from the organization? Like, because I have a view on this, but I'd just be really interested in your thoughts. Sure, uh, sure, sure. I mean, I mean, I've worked in the automotive, uh, footwear, tech, Wherever I go, at the end of the day, either I'm a manager or I have a manager. And usually the team, like with your manager, the day-to-day, it's usually four or five people. Sure, then your manager reports to someone, they report to someone, there's then 50 people, 200, 1,000, 10,000. 
but the core group that you work with usually it's no more than four to five uh, on a day-to-day -day basis that you interact with. Now, I'm not saying you're, you're not going to interact with more people and you're not going to work with 20 or 50 or 100 people, but it's this small group that you want to nurture and take care of that's going to come up with crazy and cool ideas. Because if you got, if you as a team protect, protect each other and push ideas together and inspire each other, that's really where the great ideas will come out, come out. And then, you know, as it goes up the ladder, then same thing. So, so, but, but going back to my question, why, why, why do you think that's a good thing? Like, why not 20 people? What, no, I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing. Uh, that's just how it is. But uh, oh. if it's, if it's 20 people, then even 20 people, it's not a big number. But if you're on the outside, like you look at uh, Apple, I don't know how many employees they have, but 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. You feel like the 20,000 are all working together. That's not the case. From the outside, you feel like this engine, everybody's throwing ideas and this chaos. No, the reality is there's like few people here, few people here, few people here. And it's all the teams that make up this amazing company. No, no, it makes sense. I just I, I just wondered if um, it seems to me there's an efficiency thing here, right? If you're bouncing ideas around, you've got to share that with 20 people and sync 20 people. That's that's, you know, obviously a lot harder to do than four people. Absolutely. Very hard to do with the 100 people, right? So um, I, I wondered if that was a, a thing. And the, and, the, and the other reason I asked about are they a part of the day-to-day, -day, I, I guess, is because a lot of small companies, you know, they they think, oh, I mean, I work with, with all sorts of shapes and sizes, a lot of mid-sized companies. They often put innovation teams together, I find, where most of the team are, have got a day job, right? And then they attend innovation, like workshops, or they attend innovation mm -hmm. um, initiatives. And uh, the, I think it's Peter Drucker, the management consultant from the 60s. I remember reading he wrote about the fact that you cannot live in the future and live in the present at the same time as a person, right? It's just almost impossible because sure. yeah, uh, yeah, and in yeah. business, it's impossible because what happens is, is you will always prioritize the fires of today um, over the potential bliss of tomorrow, right? Because that's how the brain works. So he recommended and recommends separating teams so that you don't have any day-to-day -day responsibility. You don't have any numbers to report against today, right? You go and figure out the future for us. We'll stay here. We'll fight the fires and, and slay the dragons of today and keep things going while you go off into the future and then come back from the future with some cool stuff. And, sure. and that's the way it works. How do you find, do you find that's the same? I thing? think that is absolutely accurate. Like when I was working in Adidas, uh, I was working in a team that was like a think tank. And our role was to think of advanced concepts and future ideas, future concepts. So the way, the way it works in the industry, and I see this like in different industries, uh, you have a team that's the inline team. Uh, or let, let me start the other way around. You have a team that's working on future concepts, innovations. This is like looking at stuff 10 years out super uh futuristic things that maybe don't make sense uh things that are not not available at the moment in terms of technology manufacturing processing and all that so that's 10 years out and then the team that i worked on was looking at stuff four years out so we're kind of getting closer to reality and then the team that we would hand off the work to would be the inline team which is one to two years out which is the team that takes stuff to the market so is that handoff from one team to another to another and to your point exactly like we are all living in the future and we hand it off to the team that is working with today's technologies, today's manufacturing processes, factories and all that. And they are responsible of bringing the products to the market. So absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. And can I ask another quick question around? So obviously we're in the podcast, Just Branding. And so the focus of our podcast, as you as you know, is 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 on brand and building brands that are relevant and customer centric and and, and have meaning. And of course, innovation plays a huge role in that. And, and it seems to me that the companies that you're talking about, they are taking the future very seriously. They're taking being relevant in the future very, very seriously. Um, do you have any kind of tips or advice to perhaps smaller businesses that are not um, not of the size of Nike or Apple or, or, or whatever, uh, or, or Adidas? Um, do you have any advice to sort of smaller businesses around innovation? Like how seriously should we all be taking innovation as we're trying to build our brands? I mean, the more innovative you are, I myself, I have a consultancy, which is considered a small business at the end of the day. 
the more innovative I, I am, the more I'm going to attract business, the more my uh, products will be, or the work that I produce is going to be compelling and uh, it's going to find interest in the market. So even if we're just talking about business and whether you're doing branding, whether you're doing anything else, uh, building companies, uh, creating products, the more innovative I am and the more I have that mindset of an innovator looking at things through an innovator's lens, it's always going to lead to better results and better outcomes. So, I mean, there's there's no question about that, in my opinion. So, so yeah, I guess just looking at how we can tweak, improve, evolve, and look at things that are out there already. Uh, there's some low-hanging fruit that we can just build on and uh, have our own take on it and create our own remix of what exists. All right, I'll come back into it now. So, Hussein, <laughs> you were talking about some... Uh, I guess traps and one of them was fear that we brought up. Was there any other traps or mistakes that you know you see people make when it comes to innovation? I think fear is definitely it was definitely like spot on with because it leads to a lot of different things. Uh, another big thing is uh, failure. So fearing to fail again goes back to fear or learning to fail. So I mean, if we look at lots of lessons of people who have innovated look at thomas edison look at any innovator not just thomas edison that's the classic example to go to but uh they all say that it's actually failure after failure is what actually taught them what not to do versus what to do so it's, it's just lesson after lesson after lesson that will get you closer to the end goal so ha not having that fear to fail and uh embracing failure and looking at it as an opportunity that you actually know something that somebody else doesn't and that you're not going to fall into that trap of what doesn't work. So that's actually an amazing thing. Having that mindset of I'm going to try again and again and again and again until it works. And it's not also just about trying again and again and again, because sometimes throughout the process, you realize that the idea actually isn't a good idea. So being flexible and sometimes you want to go from point A to point B, but innovation is on point C. So that flexibility will actually move you left and right until you you land to maybe new territory that you never expected. And sometimes it's a happy accident. Sometimes it's just throughout the process where you find yourself in a uh, an innovation land. So so yeah, I guess uh, learning to fail is a big one, definitely. Yeah, the mind the mindset kept coming up there. Um, it's just how you approach it and how you see things. So for sure, thank you. And and, and persist. I'll add also to that. Like persistence is a huge thing. A lot of people just have a dream of, oh, I want to change the world. I want to do this. I want to think big and create big ideas. If you don't put in the work and if you don't actually put in the effort, everything in life, it's never going to happen. So you got to put in the work. You got to fall down. You got to stand up. And it's just a process. You got to believe in yourself. And if it's actually a dream, you're not going to give up, give up no matter what. For me, I mean, this has nothing to do with innovation, but for me, growing up, I always had the dream to to work at Nike and work at Adidas and these sports companies. And I applied many times. I applied like 80 times over five years to different companies and got rejected and rejected and rejected. But do I really want to get into these companies? Is it really my dream? Or am I just, you know, just talking because it's cool to have this big dream? So persistence is definitely key. Do you really want it or no? I love that story. 80 times. That's a big amount of time. So yeah, persistence. Um, it's, I'm just reading some of the chapters in your book uh, just to see if there's anything else we missed. So um, honor and vision, I think was a big part of that. The first principles, uh, getting original, the evolution of ideas, mm -hmm. um, cultivating curiosity, uh, laser focus, um, diversity we talked about and challenging your thinking. So is there any out of those, you know, chapters that you'd like to explore and, you know, as the last. So, kinda... so we talked about small businesses and brands, I think like evolving ideas again, goes back to not reinventing everything every time, especially for small businesses, mm -hmm. uh, where there isn't much time and much money. So what is your existing brand? What does it do? What kind of product do you have? If you have products, what kind of, uh, services do you have? building on those and always finding a way to evolve what you already have rather than coming up with something new every time so if i have a let's say an app that does uh uh food delivery for example uh, i can order food from this app i'm not going to go tomorrow and do a, a different app and then a different app it's just going to be chaos and i'm not going to find momentum so 
what's the version two of that app? What's the version three, version four, version five? And we see that in all industries, whether it's a, a BMW 2010, 11, 12, 13, there's always that evolution, improvement. It's always better. If it's a fast car, now it's a faster car. If it's a light shoe, now it's a lighter shoe. So just finding what you do and building on it and keep going and going and going until you, you know, it's just going to be a constant uh, process of improving it and taking it to the next level. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is uh, a, a chapter in my book, I talk about practical exercises and I'll share one of them. I think we talked about like the what if and thinking uh, like from the mindset of a different person. Uh, one workshop that I actually do when I do innovation workshops is, uh, and we did this in the industry, actually, we did it a lot in Adidas. Uh, we'd go to like, uh, in the States, we have uh, Home Depot. It's like a DIY store. They sell, or a dollar store, for example. There's like different random stuff, cheap stuff. So we just go and buy all this crazy stuff that has nothing to do with each other, put them on the table. And then I tell like uh, people in the workshop, okay, we're going to do the lightest shoe on earth. Go. And they would just go and create and put stuff together that actually makes no sense at all. And then <laughs> you have a good laugh throughout the process. But then when you put stuff on the table, you, you know, it sparks different ideas like, oh, a shoe that is made out of ping pong balls. Uh, okay, it's lightweight. Maybe the material, maybe the silhouette, maybe the color. Uh, and you start to get different ideas that you never thought of. And it's stuff that has nothing to do with each other or with footwear or with automotive or, you know, anything you're working on. But it actually... Again, it's it's collaboration, uh, bringing in different things that have nothing to do with each other and creating a product out of it. It's like smash, smashing together or ping-ponging. Uh, exactly, different exactly. 2016, Nike did a show. You can actually look it up at uh, the Saloni Design Week in uh, Milan. Uh, I forgot the name of the show, but if you write Nike 2016 Saloni, S-A-L-O-N-E, uh, they actually did a whole exhibition on this, like shoes made out of different kind of uh, random stuff from the dollar store. So it's actually very interesting. It's fun and it sparks new ideas. Uh, I'm sure I, uh, I I read somewhere that that's similar to how they, you know, um, you know, in the 90s, like, um, well, at least when I was growing up, it was all, you know, everyone was concerned about aerosols, right? Spraying these particular chemicals into the atmosphere, causing problems. Mm -hmm. Um, with the ozone layer and all this stuff, and um, if I remember correctly, and I, ca I can't, I can't give credit to the team that did this, but I think they did something similar where they borrowed the concept of a ballpoint pen. Right, they're trying to figure out how can we apply deodorant to a to a human body in mm -hmm. a convenient way. And what they did was they were looking at other ways. Well, where else is liquid kind of taken from one container and s sort of smoothly? distributed onto another surface and and you know as you know as this kind of innovation team worked together they found the the, the concept of the ballpoint pen right which mm -hmm. was writing had solved that problem in 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 you know in a, in, a, in a completely different world in a completely different application and then they took that and they made it bigger and they created the the roll on aftershave or the roll on uh, deodorant um, and um, obviously, that's that's been huge. So it's interesting, isn't it? When you smash different worlds together, how you can get some interesting thinking that comes out. Um, and uh, uh, there's one, there's one that um, our good friend um, Jacob uh, Marty Newmeyer, who's a brand uh, brand expert, does, which I I find quite exciting. Uh, when he does, I think he wrote about this in a book called Zag, which is about being different and innovating mm -hmm. and, and and unusual. And he talks about the assumption, uh, I think it's called the assumption flip. So if you took a, a standard um, uh, kind of uh, experience, let's say a wine shop, and you, you get a team to work out, well, what are the assumptions for the average wine shop? You go in, there's shelves, there's, a, there's thousands of bottles of wine, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and you list all these things out. And then you 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 do the opposite, right? So the flip is now, okay, now we've de detailed that. What would the opposite of that be? right and then you flip all of the assumptions um and then you step back and you look at it now some of those flips might be completely insane and unuseful to the to the situation but other ones might might create something very unusual very distinctive very innovative so for example instead of having thousands of bottles on all the shelves what if you only had five right mm -hmm. five bottles in the store and what if that then um you know was it was was a, a unique selection that had been selected um, and so you weren't overwhelming your customer. You were actually welcoming them into a very specialist sort of situation. Now you've got something really interesting, really different, very unusual, very innovative um, that you can build a distinctive brand around. So that's 
That's Absolutely. kind of a... And, and one of the exercises in the book is exactly that, reverse assumptions. Oh, cool. Reverse yeah, yes. I, I love that you mentioned that. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, that brings up so many cool ideas, uh, as you mentioned, like very unexpected things and starts to make you think outside the box. So what if a restaurant doesn't have... What if a restaurant doesn't serve food? Then what does that restaurant do? Then you start to think, okay, maybe you take your own food. Maybe it's like this or that or... Uh, you know, some ideas make sense, some don't, but again, makes you think outside of the box. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I guess what we're, we're trying to talk, we're talking about here is, is you see the human brain, I guess it sits and it's comfortable in what it knows. And we kind Absolutely. of have to shake that brain up a little bit and smash it about a bit and introduce it to some new stuff and force it almost to think, as to use your words, outside of the box that it's already in. And mm -hmm. and it's really interesting that, to, to my mind at least, that you're running innovation teams and consulting by doing that it's not like I, I guess from what i'm hearing it's not like you can just suddenly come along and instantly create something new you have to work at this stuff you have to Absolutely. explore Absolutely. it bounce ideas around challenge yourself run workshops and i think the more that companies do that this is my view anyway the more that companies just spend like even if it's just one day a year where we're just gonna do some innovation um, and we're gonna force ourselves to do that that is something that that would be highly valuable. I mean, ideally, you want to do it in a more structured way with teams over longer periods with with clear kind of um, objectives to come up with new products or new new ideas. But at least do something, right? I meet so many business people and I say, okay, they, they always say in their brand values, we're innovative. And you're like, <laughs> okay, so prove that, prove it. What are you actually, as a customer, what am I actually seeing from you on a regular basis that proves you're innovative. They're like, well, eight years ago, we created this new widget or something. It's like, yeah, yeah, but that was eight <laughs> years ago. This isn't, you're not innovative. It's not in your culture. Sure, and sure, if I'm sure. an employee, prove to me you're innovative. If I'm going to, you're going to hire me. What is in, where are the innov innovation initiatives in this business? So I can, and that you can tell me about all hands events and stuff and, 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 you know, what's going on. Um, and I find that, um, that when you challenge business leaders like that, and they're like, oh, we're not that innovative after all. It's like, okay, well, that's okay. We can do something about that, right? We can, we can, we can build this in uh, to your business routines, to your thinking. When you got to allocate budget, we have got to allocate people. But we can do this. Otherwise, your brand's going to die. So, sure, sure, sure. And, and to your point, exactly. I mean, I think even like businesses, they're always afraid. Again, it goes back to the idea of fear and failure. They're afraid of messing up or doing something that doesn't make sense or that's wrong or embar embarrassing themselves. So, but I think, I can, as we said, embrace that. Uh, if you've been around for eight years and you can show me that you messed up here and here and here, actually, I think it's a cool thing. It shows mm -hmm. that you're you're fearless and you have ideas that you're not afraid of just following the pack and having the followers mindset. So, you know, just putting your ideas on the table. Some is some are going to work, some aren't going to work. It's not always going to work, but at least uh, you have a vision and you're trying to execute. And once you fail again, you as we mentioned, you you get back up and you. You start to evaluate and move forward. So, so I think it's the fear of failure and thinking that they are always doing things right. I love that, and I think that's where it really ties into brand and brand purpose, right? Because a lot of people, if you understand your purpose as a brand and who you're trying to serve, then that is not a static thing. Those people change; they get different problems. They, they, you know, they, 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 uh, they want to become something different. You, your job as a brand is to keep up. Um, uh, to listen to them and to, as you say, live in the future, you know, have to have people thinking about what are the future challenges, what, what is the future trends going to be like? So I think that's the bridge between innovation and, and, and kind of brand strategy is to really understand that it's your role as a brand to continue to be relevant. Um, but I had a question. So uh, a business question, actually. Um, in terms of innovation, uh, have you any views on how, because it costs money, right? And it is risky. So how I've I've come across businesses, for example, that will say we will put one percent of our profits into 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 innovation or five percent or whatever the percentage is, and then they will have programs that use that budget. Um, and the the idea is is that they'll want a certain amount of innovations, either either incremental or you know completely off the wall new. Have you got any thoughts on um, on budgets and and what kind of percentage of of sort of is, have you got any general thoughts on that or, or or do you just sort of leave it up to each business uh to decide yeah i mean obviously if you're a big company like apple and nike and these giants uh they have uh money allocated for r d 
and you see them actually coming up with new materials, new processes, manufacturing, all the crazy stuff. So they have the money and the budget for it. But when you're talking about small business, when I like the way I approach it, uh, I don't really allocate any money for it. But what I do is I do allocate a lot of money to come up with concepts. And again, concepts, it's a concept. There's no right or wrong. Uh, what if this or that? Uh, what if this shoe was, uh, what if Mercedes did the shoe? Like I'm doing a concept now. And it, one, it's cool. Two, it brings in exposure. Like the media goes crazy about the stuff. And three, it brings in business. So, and business is money. And then you put that money and that time again, back into creating more concepts. And yeah, there's no right and wrong with concepts. So I think like that, you can hit three birds with one stone. Uh, if you just do what if concepts, futuristic concepts, it actually shows your vision as a designer, as a business owner of like how you're thinking outside the box. Like with some of my clients, maybe it's a tight box that I can't really innovate a lot around or, you know, it's going to be innovative, but maybe it's not going to be as big as Apple. But uh, I go in with that mindset to do something new and different and uh, better every time. But with my what if concepts and with the things that actually just for myself, I can just go wild and go crazy and nobody's going to judge me for it. So I think that's the best way to do it. Love it. All right. I think we can wrap this up. But before we do, do you, do you have one final tip for unlocking the innovation? Oh, like I think we say? talked about a lot of tips. <laughs> oh, no. All right. He I was going to, yeah, to give you the one, one last chance for any more, but if not, we can just ask where you, uh, you know, where people can get, get the book, where they can connect with you. Sure, um, sure, sure. So the book will be out September 6th on Amazon, The Innovator's Handbook, Unleashing Your uh, Creative Mindset. Short, It's a short guide. Again, I mentioned in the introduction, it's not the ultimate guide to innovation. It's supposed to spark your curiosity and creativity. So that's the whole point of the book. And just bringing in some of my learnings from my experiences and my perspective uh, towards how you can have that mindset shift. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, my website, email me. I'm very easy to find. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I love that you shared it's not the ultimate guide because it's it's filled with illustrations, very creative, and it's, um, you know, it speaks Absolutely. to, you know. And creative. I mean, just this conversation now, like you guys had different ideas and I, I learned from you and, you know, we shared different kind of perspectives. And I mean, that goes back to the idea of innovation. We're all diverse and different, different locations. Uh, you guys have read different books. I've read different books, different backgrounds, and we share the insights and ideas and there's no true answer to what is innovation. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and your, your wisdom, Hussein. And just, um, thank yeah, you guys. Thanks for having it. me. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. It's been awesome. Thank you. <laughs>